My wife and I had an encounter with something horrifying while we were camping in the Sierra Nevada mountains of California. This happened around five years ago, but it is still very vivid in my mind, hers too. I'm a wildland firefighter based out of California. Yeah, those guys who parachute into fires. It's a rush and honestly it can be pretty intense, but it's what I do. And my wife, she's a high school biology teacher with a fascination for botany. She's got this knack for making kids love plants, even those who'd rather be glued to their phones. We live in this small town nestled east of Sacramento. It's the kind of place where everyone knows your dog's name, and the grocery store still gives out paper tickets for the raffle. It's quiet, surrounded by nature, and the communities tighten it just the way we like it. Anyway, about five years back, we decided to take a break and spend a weekend camping. We're both nature buffs, so it was right up our alley. Packed up the truck with gear, and off we went to the Sierra Nevada mountains. The plan was to kick back, enjoy the wilderness, and maybe catch some fish. We rolled into the campground late Friday. It was one of those off the beaten path spots, not too popular, which was perfect for us. Wanted to feel like we had the place to ourselves. That first night was a bit creepy though. Kept hearing footsteps around the tent, big heavy ones. My wife's a sound sleeper, but even she was turning and mumbling. You hear that? But we didn't do anything about it that night. I was up at the crack of dawn next morning, fishing rod in hand, ready to hit the stream. My wife stayed back at the campsite, and I hiked down a trail that led into the valley below. The stream that ran through this valley held trout, so I figured it would be good fishing. There are no trees or brush along most of this trail, and as you descend further into the valley, there is even less vegetation except for some scrubby bushes here and there. Once I reached the bottom of this canyon-like area, I found myself standing in knee-high grass that covered most of its floor. I started working my way upstream from where I entered until eventually reaching a spot about a quarter mile away. It wasn't long before something strange began happening. At first, all seemed normal, but after maybe 15 minutes or so had gone by, all sounds stopped. It's hard for me to describe how deafeningly silent everything became. All bird songs ceased completely, and they were everywhere prior to that moment. Then, the rustling sounds began. You could hear movement coming from every direction. As far as one could tell, these sounds came from within several yards, but nothing appeared that could be causing them. Because everything else grew quiet, whatever caused those sounds seemed to grow louder than they actually were. The movement continued for a minute or so, then stopped. After another few minutes, the same thing occurred again. This pattern repeated itself over and over. After a while, I began feeling like something was watching me. That sense you get when someone is standing behind you but you can't see them. It felt very unnerving, as if I were being observed by some unknown presence. I eventually became so spooked that I decided to leave without even catching anything. As soon as I got back, I could see a look on my wife's face that wasn't good. I had her tell me what was up before telling her what happened to me. She said that at one point, she suddenly heard loud splashing coming from a small brook directly across from where our tent stood, as if someone were jumping up and down in the water. A few moments later, a huge boulder came crashing into our campsite, landing just inches away from her. She looked in the direction where it came from, only to find no one there no person and no animal. When she told me about the boulder, her voice was shaking. She's tough as nails, but this shook her. She'd been sitting there, sketching some wildflowers she'd found when the splashing started. She thought maybe a deer had come down to drink, not uncommon around here. But that rock, the size of a small cooler, lobbed into our sight like a warning shot. That was no deer. We've had run-ins with wildlife before, you live in the sticks, it happens. Bears, coyotes, the usual suspects. But this was different. There was a deliberateness to it. Something calculating. I was trying to piece it together. Wildlife doesn't hurl rocks. People do. But who? We hadn't seen another soul since we got there. The nearest campsite was miles away, and this wasn't exactly a spot you'd stumble upon. We both sat there the fire from last night down to embers and the morning chill was starting to seep in. We decided to pack up, 
not much of a discussion there. The feeling of being watched hadn't left me, and now she felt it too. Packing up was done in record time. We moved with a purpose. Every snap twig or rustle in the underbrush made us jump. We were halfway to being done when we heard it. A low, guttural growl. Not like anything we'd heard before. It wasn't a bear or a mountain lion. This was something else. Something we weren't supposed to hear. Our eyes locked and we didn't need words. We dropped what we were doing and bolted for the truck, leaving half our gear behind. We didn't stop driving until we hit the main road, and even then, we didn't say much. It was only when we got home, our safe haven, that we tried to make sense of it all. Could it have been a person messing with us? Maybe. But why? And how? And that growl? It haunts me. We've been back to the mountains since then, but never to that spot. Some places you just don't return to. They say the Sierra Nevada has its secrets, and I think some are meant to stay that way. I'm a 42-year-old male from New York. I was in the U.S. Army for 10 years and did three tours of duty in Iraq and Afghanistan. I now work for the Department of Homeland Security. I grew up in southern Westchester County, New York. My family had some land upstate near Lake George, where we would spend weekends during the spring and summer months. I've always been interested in Bigfoot lore, but never gave it much thought until my own personal encounter on October 8th at Watkins Glen State Park along Seneca Lake. Seneca is one of the Finger Lakes, which are located roughly halfway between Buffalo and Syracuse. My girlfriend and I decided to take a trip to Watkins Glen on Saturday morning because she knew how much I enjoyed hiking. We arrived around 9 a.m. The park was not crowded since it was late in the season. The gorge trail starts just beyond the main entrance. There were several people walking ahead of us, but we soon left them behind. The trail runs along both sides of the stream and takes you over many waterfalls. This gorge has steep rock walls and deep crevices cut into rocks by centuries of rushing water. We hiked about halfway through before deciding to turn back since we wanted to check out other areas within the park. The scenery is amazing. Most tourists stick to these trails since they are easily accessible and well marked. There are numerous trails throughout the park that lead visitors away from crowds. One such trail leads up a hillside above a gorge. Once atop the ridgeline, there's a beautiful view overlooking the valley below. Park officials do warn visitors not to stray off marked trails because of the dangers of rock slides, falling trees, and animals that inhabit the area. Well, we decided to take a trail that led away from the gorge and up onto the ridgeline. It was about 11 a.m. when we started this part of our hike. We hadn't seen anyone else on this trail. It wasn't well maintained, so it appeared that few people ventured here. We actually came across some downed trees blocking the path, but you could still navigate around them if you took your time. We walked for maybe an hour before deciding to stop and rest. This is the point where I noticed a strange odor in the air. It smelled like something dead, but I couldn't pinpoint where it was coming from. The ground cover consisted of ferns, moss, and various weeds, along with some rocks. There were also numerous pine trees scattered throughout the area. I leaned against a tree while my girlfriend sat on a large boulder next to me. As we rested, she suddenly asked, What's that noise? I listened intently. It sounded like something walking through the woods off to our right. Then I heard what seemed to be a grunting sound. My girlfriend looked at me wide-eyed and whispered, what is that? We both stood there quietly, listening as whatever it was got closer. I reached into my backpack for my binoculars, hoping to get a jump on seeing an animal approaching. At first, all I saw was a brush moving. Then I caught sight of a large black object slowly making its way toward us. When the object finally emerged into the clearing below the hillside, I nearly dropped my binoculars. I've seen plenty of pictures and videos over the years so I knew immediately what this creature was. I was looking at a Bigfoot. Instantly, I wondered if he was aware of us being here. The creature stood about seven, eight feet tall. He had long, shaggy black hair covering his entire body. He stopped occasionally sniffing the air, as though trying to pick up a scent. My instincts from my time in the army 
told me to stay calm and assess the situation thoroughly before making any rash decisions. I remember clearly how, during my tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, we were trained to observe first, to understand the intent and behavior of potential threats before acting. This training kicked in almost instinctively as I watched the creature through my binoculars. As the Bigfoot moved with a purposeful gait, sniffing the air and stopping to drink from the stream, I scanned the area for possible escape routes, should it decide to approach us. My mind raced through various scenarios, calculating our best options for evasion without attracting its attention. The dense foliage and downed trees could offer some cover, but they also made quick movements difficult. I remembered how we were taught to use our environment to our advantage, to blend in and move silently, skills that suddenly seemed as crucial here in the peaceful woods of Watkins Glen as they had been in the conflict zones overseas. It struck me how bizarre it was to apply these tactics against a creature from American folklore. Yet here I was, doing just that. Despite the fear and the adrenaline, part of me was fascinated. This was a living being, not an enemy combatant, and I felt a profound sense of awe and respect. I made a mental note to keep our presence as unobtrusive as possible, to avoid any unnecessary disturbance. In those tense moments watching the Bigfoot, my girlfriend and I communicated with hand signals. We agreed silently on a plan to retreat slowly, keeping our movements deliberate and quiet, avoiding snapping branches or rustling leaves. As we made our way back, I couldn't help but reflect on how my military training had prepared me for a situation as unexpected as this. It was a reminder that the skills and instincts that I had honed in one part of my life could come to my aid in the most unforeseen circumstances. The experience with that creature not only left me with an incredible story, but also a deep appreciation for the unexpected ways in which our past experiences shape our reactions to the new and unknown. So, let me take you back to September 4th, 2006. My wife and I were cruising through Joshua Tree National Park in California. We had her dad trailing behind us because he insisted on driving himself in his own vehicle. It was high noon when we hit the park, meaning we had the whole day ahead of us before nightfall. Now I've got to tell you, I've always been fascinated by the idea of encountering Bigfoot, or any cryptid really, and this spot in California. It's like a hot spot for Bigfoot sightings, and all sorts of wild tales about mysterious creatures. So, we thought, why not spend some time driving around the park looking? It was mostly as a joke, but I was also secretly hopeful. Maybe we'd spot some deer or elk, which are more common around there, but who knows, right? About an hour in, something massive caught my eye off to the right, just behind some trees near a creek bed. The trees were pretty close to the road, so I slowed down to catch a better glimpse of whatever it was. And man, did my heart skip a beat when this thing turned toward me. Initially, it had its back to us, but then it seemed to get curious, or maybe confused. This creature looked like something out of a sci-fi movie, walking upright like a human, but with the build of an ape. Yet, it wasn't as hairy as you'd expect an ape to be. It had this shaggy hair, not completely covered in fur. But here's where it gets wild. Its arms were so long they almost touched the ground, even when it stood up straight. The craziest part, though, was its face, or the lack thereof. Instead of a typical face, it had what seemed like a small snout and long white whiskers hanging over where you'd expect a mouth to be. But no real mouth, just a sort of hole in front of its snout, and its eyes? Huge, round, solid black with white rings, kind of like some deep-sea fish. Plus, this thing had what looked like a long, pointed horn sticking out from the top of its head. So there I am, just staring at this creature by the creek bed, trying to wrap my head around what we were seeing. My wife then asks if I'm okay, noticing the sudden stop. When I pointed out the creature, she laughed, thinking I was pulling her leg and it was some kind of a joke, until she took a closer look. She went from nervously laughing to full-on panic mode realizing how close we were to something straight out of a legend. My wife's trying to make sense of it all, her laughter gone, 
replaced by this tight grip on my arm. And I'm trying to stay cool, but inside, my heart's racing like a sprinter at the starting block. Then, out of nowhere, her dad, who's been trailing behind us in his old Ford, pulls up. He's been around, seen things, not the kind to scare easy. But when he sees what we're looking at, he just stops dead. Engine idling, window down and his jaw just drops. This creature, it's not bothered by us, not really. It's just there, sniffing the air like it's catching a scent. My wife's dad, he's an old school guy, never leaves home without his camera, the kind with actual film in it. He reaches over, slow, so slow, and starts snapping pictures. The sound of the shutter, it's like thunder in the silence of that park. Now, I don't know if it's the camera or us being there too long, but that creature, it didn't like it, not one bit. It stands up taller, and that's when we see it in full. It's tall like NBA player tall, and it lets out this sound, a low rumble that starts deep and just rolls out like fog over the water. It's a warning, it has to be. My wife, she whispers to me, we should go, her voice all tremble in fear. But her dad, he's got this look in his eye, the kind that says he's not about to let a once in a lifetime shot slip away. He keeps snapping pictures until the creature, it just turns and strides off into the woods those long arms swinging, the horn on its head catching the sunlight as it disappears. We sit there, the three of us, in silence, until her dad finally says, well, that's something you don't see every day. He's trying to lighten the mood, but our nerves are shot, hearts still thumping loud in our chests. We decide to head back as fast as possible. My wife's dad, he's already planning to get the film developed, talking about how he's going to prove to his buddies that he's not just full of tall tales. But here's the twist, right? We get back, and he heads to his trusted photo shop. He's giddy, like a kid at Christmas, waiting to see what comes out. But when he gets the photos, there's nothing. Just pictures of the trees, the creek bed, and us staring off into the woods. The creature? It's not there. Not a single shot. He's baffled, keeps saying he got it in the frame. We all saw him take the pictures. But the creature, it's like it was never there. And that's when it hits us. What if this thing, whatever it was, had some way of, I don't know, not showing up on film? It sounds nuts, but then again, seeing something like that, it's not exactly normal, is it? So we're left with this story, this wild encounter, that sounds like a fisherman's the one that got away tale. But we know what we saw. And her dad, he keeps those photos, even though they're just of the woods, as a reminder of the day we saw something unexplainable. It becomes a sort of family legend. The day we all stared into the unknown, and the unknown stared right back. It's been years now, and every once in a while we pull out those photos, sit around the living room, and talk about that day. My wife's dad, he'll point to a blank spot between the trees and say, right there, that's where it stood. And we'll all nod knowing that some things in this world just can't be captured on film, only in memory. Hello, I was on your channel and noticed that you have people who have seen strange things in Texas. I had a sighting of an unusual creature that occurred in Houston about 10 years ago. At the time, my husband and I were driving home from visiting family late one night. It was around midnight when we turned onto Eldridge Parkway. We both saw what looked like an owl sitting atop the stoplight on the opposite side of the road, with its wings spread out to each side. There is no way this bird could see anything or hunt for food with any sort of efficiency at this time of night. I remember thinking that owls are nocturnal, but I thought they were more stealthy, like not wanting to be out in the open. Not only did it seem strange because of where it was perched, but also due to its sheer size as well. Let me explain. As we drove closer towards this bird, our headlights illuminated it enough for us to clearly see that it stood over four feet tall from head to toe, if not more than five feet. Its wingspan appeared massive too, easily seven, eight feet wide. My first thought after seeing this thing up close was, what is going on? But then reality set in. 
I mean, come on folks, who ever heard of an owl being anywhere near those dimensions? It's impossible unless someone has somehow managed to genetically engineer such a monstrosity. Then again, maybe someone has found a way. Who knows these days? Well anyway, once we got past the shock value, our next reaction became one of concern, followed by another question, what is it doing here? And is this normal behavior for owls? Obviously, neither myself nor my husband were able to provide any definitive answers, but our heads were trying to make this have a normal explanation. After passing under the stoplight, we turned our heads back towards the creature as it came into view from behind the streetlight pole. This allowed us to see that there were no other vehicles coming down the road and we were able to slow down with plenty of time to take a good long look at this thing. What struck me most about its appearance was not just how huge or intimidating it looked, but rather something entirely different. It seemed wrong somehow, if you catch my drift. Mostly what bothered me so much was its eyes. They appeared completely devoid of any sort of life whatsoever, like black, empty voids set deep within the skull. As we looked at those lifeless eyes, my husband whispered something that sent chills down my spine. Do you see that? He asked, barely above a breath. It's like it's looking right through us, like it sees something we don't. I couldn't help but nod, feeling the weight of its gaze, even from a distance. For a moment, we just sat there in the car, the engine idling softly, as we tried to make sense of the situation. My husband, always the rational one, tried to break down what we were seeing. Perhaps it's a species of owl we're not familiar with, but his voice was full of doubt and I could tell he didn't believe his own words. It was then that the creature moved. It was a slow, deliberate motion, unfolding its wings even further, as if stretching out the span of its impressive silhouette against the night sky. My husband tensed beside me, his hands gripping the steering wheel tighter. That's no ordinary bird, he muttered, the skeptic in him retreating with every second we spent in the creature's presence. We watched, transfixed, as the creature then did something extraordinary. It didn't take off into the sky as we expected. Instead, it hopped down from the stoplight and landed on the road with a grace that seemed impossible for something of its size. The thud of its feet hitting the pavement was surprisingly soft, but the impact resonated with us, sitting in our car just a few yards away. My husband's curiosity got the better of him then. He reached for the door handle. I grabbed his arm, shaking my head. Let's not, I said, my voice quivering. Some things are better left alone. He looked at me, his eyes wide with a mix of fear and wonder, and slowly nodded. He put the car in drive and we moved forward, leaving the creature behind us. As we drove away, neither of us spoke for a long while. When we finally did talk, it was to agree that we wouldn't tell anyone about what we'd seen. We didn't think we'd be believed, and also, we wanted to keep from starting a spectacle in the area with people coming in from everywhere to try and see the thing. But that night stayed with us, etched into our memories. Every so often, my husband would bring it up, always with a tone of speculation in his voice. What do you think it was, he'd ask, staring off into the distance. Could it have been something not of this world? I didn't have the answers, and honestly, I wasn't sure I wanted them. We never did drive back there to look for it and never saw it again on any random time we drove that road again. At this point, it's pretty much in the past, but we do still think about it. If there's one thing I don't like to talk about openly, it's my run-in with a Sasquatch. Locally, I've become known as a bit of an alarmist fool because of the tale. But I swear to you, and on everything I hold dear, that every word of this is true. In the wooded valleys surrounding Paducah, Kentucky, I came upon one of the creatures three winters ago while I was out hunting a runaway hog. I never did find the hog, but I followed an awful foul odor for a good mile back into the sticks, thinking I'd find a rotting hog corpse eventually. The snow wasn't real deep. It had been a mild winter so far, and while the ground was frozen underneath me, the only snow we had was a light dusting that had fallen just that morning, so I didn't have any tracks to go off of. 
I just smelled the god-awful stench from far off and decided to try to follow my nose as it was my only hope in the moment. As I got further into the sticks, I couldn't help but feel like there was something else out there with me though. A couple times I felt like I could hear twigs breaking somewhere back behind me. Then, when I turned around to look, I wouldn't see anything. This went on for a good half hour or more. Finally, I stopped turning around. I would just call out behind me who's there, as I stood still waiting to see if anyone or anything would respond. The deeper into the sticks I got, it seemed like the worse the smell got too. This gave me the sense that I was getting closer to whatever was laid out there rotting, and I felt sure I'd know what happened to my lost hog soon enough. About the third or fourth time, I stopped and called out who's there. I heard something respond. It was a low grunt, almost hog-like itself. This caused me to spin around fast and wonder was the hog still alive? Was that what had been following me out there in the woods? I let out a hog call, and I waited, and I heard nothing. I remembered I had a couple cookies in my pocket. I always carried Oreos out with me to check on the horses in the morning to offer them as treats, and I hadn't given all of them away that morning. I pulled an Oreo from my pocket, hoping the hog would want one as badly as the horses always did. I have a treat for you, I yelled out. Still, nothing. I was getting pretty frustrated with this whole ordeal and feeling a little foolish. I thought about all the other things out in the woods that grunt and ultimately decided I was probably trying to lure in a deer with an Oreo cookie. The smell had now grown unbearable, but there was still no sign of anything rotting anywhere. I decided I was done with my search and I was going to call it a day. I was froze to the bone and that hog, if it wasn't dead, was too far gone by now to track. I'd just have to wait at home and hope she showed back up on her own time. I got up and started the long walk back to the house. As I did though, that feeling of being watched grew even stronger. Now I could sense something right behind me and even thought I might be hearing the long drawn out breath of a large animal or a person. I'm not ashamed to say I was scared. I said out loud, whatever you want from me, just tell me. Of course, it didn't say a thing. Slowly, I turned around. This time, it didn't run and hide. About five yards back behind me, standing at least 10 feet tall, there was a large hairy mass. It was human in body form and stature, but much bigger all around. It had deep set dark eyes and a muzzle with large wide set nostrils set above a large protruding mouth. Its ears were large but sat flat against the side of its head like a human, and it was naked but covered in scraggly long hair. I reckon that's how it had managed to hide so easily among the brush. Now again, this might be something I should be ashamed of, but I'm not. Anyone would have done the same in that situation. I felt a warmth run down my leg as I started wetting myself, staring at it. I know it must have noticed, too, what with my jeans darkening and the steam rising up. It got a look on its face that seemed almost like pity as it backed up a few steps. I started walking backwards, carefully stepping. I lifted my hands up and stretched my arms out to the side for balance and also to show the thing I wasn't trying to be a threat to it of any kind. I had nothing in my hands. I didn't want to fight. As I stepped away, it dawned on me that the smell was getting less and less the further from it I got. It seemed as if the source of the smell was the Sasquatch itself, and it had been getting worse and worse as the Sasquatch got closer to me while stalking me back in those woods. Now I don't know what he wanted, and I guess I never will. Maybe he was intending to harm me. Maybe he was just curious about what I was and what I was doing out there. Maybe he too was in pursuit of my hog. The only thing I do know for sure is I won't ever venture back in those woods alone again. And the next time I smell something rotting off in the distance, I'm going to turn the other way and not look back. I usually don't tell this story unless I'm drinking. Some people need a little liquid courage to talk to a stranger on the other side of the bar. Me. I need it to talk. It's hard for me to open up. You understand, don't you? It's hard for me to be vulnerable. 
especially when it reveals that I've encountered something weird or unexplainable. I don't mind putting back a few drinks, but that doesn't mean I want to be the crazed person at the bar, you know. We've all got that friend or that uncle who starts telling stories while the rest of the party swaps awkward stares. I don't want to be that guy, but I have a story, and sometimes it demands to be told. Sometimes I think I saw her, just so I could talk about it. I was working in waste management at the time, specifically in the region's forestry subdivision. Our job was to go out after forestry operations or firefighting measures to clean up the byproduct of those activities. Building a forest makes a mess, as does putting one out when it's burning. It was good work. It made me feel good anyway. I also felt like I was doing my part to protect the environment. I was doing what I could and that's what mattered. In this specific incident, we were responding after a wildfire had been extinguished. The fire teams involved had used a local river as a natural line of defense, and we were going to remove the waste that they left behind. That meant a few long days in the ash and mud and wading through the shallow river to restore a bit of balance to the forest. One morning though, as we plunged through the fog and approached the riverside, we learned that we weren't alone. There was a woman there idling beside the river. The dark water was lapping our bare ankles. Her feet were fully submerged. She was wearing a long white dress. From where I stood, I could see that the mud had stained the hem along the bottom. Her hair was in disarray, untamed and hiding her face from us. Not that she looked our way, of course. She was facing the water. She was staring at the current strangely, as if it might deliver whatever she was looking for. We called out. We thought she might have been someone caught in the fire. There was enough ash on her tan skin to make that believable, but she didn't respond to our words. When we tried to get closer, something stopped us. Each pace we took in her direction felt like another step toward the edge of a cliff. My body screamed at me to stop moving. I did. So did everyone else on the scene. That's when we noticed she wasn't moving at all. Her shoulders weren't rising or falling. Her hair wasn't blowing the wind. Where the cold river water kissed her legs, there were no signs of shivers of goose flesh. We told ourselves that meant she was in shock. That validated our theories and made us truly believe that we'd found a survivor. We called for paramedics. They were more than 20 minutes away. 20 minutes we now would have to stand and stare at this woman. I couldn't wait that long. You understand, right? When someone's in trouble, somebody has to act. Everyone has a so-called time clock inside of them that starts ticking down during a crisis. When that clock hits zero, you move. My clock hit zero first. I moved forward, ignored the stones of anxiety piling up in my guts and reached for the shoulder of the frozen woman. I thought I saw my friends opening their mouths. I expected to hear them warn me away, but I didn't hear anything in that moment. I felt the raspy threads of her dress on my fingertips. I felt the hard, cold skin underneath. She felt like marble in my hands. She didn't feel real at all. She certainly didn't feel like the fragile body I was expecting. Then she started to turn. Her neck shifted erratically, one short click at a time. She looked my way. I was staring at a curtain of hair at first, dark and thick and curled like snakes. But I saw the shimmer of wet eyes underneath. I thought she was under there, separated from the real world by just this sheet of dark wisps. I thought I'd brush her hair aside and she'd come back to life. Her skin would be soft and warm again. I dragged my knuckles against her wiry locks and laid my eyes on her face. She'd been crying long enough to scar the tissue on her cheeks. Her eyes were red and swollen. Her lips were puffy and cracked. She might have been pretty at one time. That day, she truly looked as if she'd walked through the fire, or maybe stood in the river while the flames raged around her. The other people on site say I screamed after that. They say I fell frantically into the river and thrashed around as if I'd suddenly become epileptic. They rushed to help me and eventually dragged me out. And then the woman was gone. I remember coming to on the side of that river and looking for her, but it was like she was never there. Any footprints she might have left were trampled by my colleagues. I couldn't be upset with them, of course. They'd moved in to save my life. 
Who knows what would have happened if I'd stayed in that river, kicking and jerking as though I was being attacked. I could have drowned. I don't even want to think what would have happened if I were alone. Unfortunately, that's where the story ends. I don't know the meaning or the purpose or the message you're supposed to walk away from this with. I only know that sometimes stories like mine just beg to be told. And sometimes it's not any deeper than that. I'm Greg, a seasoned hiker and avid bird watcher. I've experienced my fair share of bizarre wildlife encounters, but my experience on the Appalachian Trail last fall was unparalleled. I was there for migration season, and it's quite a spectacle on the Appalachian Trail. This is one point where a variety of birds like the distinctive orange and black Blackburnian warbler make their long journey from North American breeding grounds to their winter home in South America. I only lived about 300 miles away and was up for the trip. The opportunity for close encounters with these birds drew me to the trail that day. I arrived at my designated home base and got out of the car right away to head onto the trail. I was itching to get out there and I figured I could set up my sleeping quarters later. As I ventured deep into the trail, my senses were finely tuned, my eyes searching for a glimpse of the tiny black Bernian warbler. The forest around me was bursting with life. Every inhale brought in a pleasant aroma. The familiar scent of the forest. The damp, earthy smell mingling with the musky fragrance of decomposing foliage. Suddenly, this serene mix of sight, sounds, and smells was disrupted. A heavy, nauseating odor hit me. It was completely overpowering the earthy forest scents that I was accustomed to. It was the stench of decay, pungent and repulsive, hanging heavily in the air. It wasn't merely the smell of an animal's remains left by a predator. Those were fairly common in the forest and had a certain natural odor to them. This was different. It was much stronger and more nauseating. This odor was pervasive. It wasn't just the strength of the smell that was alarming. It was its ominous undercurrent that unsettled me. It hinted at something out of the ordinary, something unnatural. Each step I took felt like a descent into the unknown as the smell grew stronger, gnawing at my senses. It was as if I was being led by this odor towards an unseen danger. This wasn't just a smell, it was a sign, an invisible sign warning me that I was nearing something that didn't belong. I knew that something potentially dangerous lurked nearby. Suddenly, there it was, emerging from the thick foliage. A monstrous entity that stood at least nine feet tall, a hulking silhouette that appeared all the more ominous against the backdrop of the towering trees. It boasted a strange mix of characteristics with spindly deer-like legs supporting an upright form that was reminiscent of a human's posture. It was an eerie fusion of human and animal that didn't seem to completely belong in either realm. Its body was a chilling sight, like a grotesque sculptural rendition of a walking cadaver. It was as if it was barely covered by a layer of rotting skin stretched taut over a stark skeletal structure. The skin itself was peeling off in places, revealing the bare bones beneath. Every movement it made caused its skin to ripple and tear further, creating a horrific sight. The creature's face was the most unsettling part. It bore an uncanny resemblance to a deer skull, complete with a snout and sharp, bony ridges where one would expect to find a brow. But its eyes were set deep into their hollow sockets and two orbs glowed with an intense, almost phosphorescent, yellow light. When I first spotted it, the creature was eerily still. But soon, it was clear it had noticed me, those glowing eyes fixed on me, sizing me up. Despite its deer-like legs, its movements were rigid and calculated, not the graceful strides associated with such animals. Its unsettling blend of animalistic and deliberate behavior made the encounter more chilling. My first instinct was to flee, but I was momentarily paralyzed locked in a silent standoff with the creature. But survival instinct prevailed, and I slowly moved away from the creature and then broke out into a full run. 
Once I was well out of sight, the rest of my hike was a blur. As soon as I reached cell service, I contacted the local park ranger's office. Their reaction was a blend of skepticism and concern, promising to investigate. I never did hear back from them, but I made it a point to check back in to see what they had found. I called the office, but no one answered and I had to leave a message. I never thought I would hear back, but a few days later they informed me they had found nothing unusual. That seemed suspicious to me. Right then and there, I decided to start my own investigation to figure out what I saw, albeit my research would be done online. It didn't take me long to realize that the creature's description matched that of the Wendigo, a mythical creature known to inhabit part of America and Canada. Despite the lack of tangible evidence at this scene, I cannot dismiss what I experienced. The memory of the encounter, the smell of decay, the fear, and fascination they remain as vivid as ever. As it stands now, I am planning a trip back. Back when I was a kid in the 80s, my dad took me and my older brother on a long camping trip. It was one of those spontaneous decisions. He packed up his truck with everything we would need and off we went. We drove for what seemed like hours until we got to some woods where he said he'd stayed with Grandpa and Uncle Billy when he was a kid. We set up the tent and my brother and I wanted to make a fire. That's the part we always look forward to. And anyway, the sun would be setting soon and we were getting pretty hungry. My brother and I kept talking about how much we wanted hot dogs the whole time. So my brother and I headed into the trees to grab some kindling before it got too dark. We must have gone further than we had intended. As you know, you see one tree, you've seen them all which can be confusing. That's kind of just how the woods are to an unexperienced woodsman. And we were just kids so we didn't really know any better. After going in too far, we became a little disoriented but Jason, my older brother, was sure he knew the way out. I remember him kind of panicking a little bit, but he was still trying to reassure me that everything was okay and that he was going to lead us out of this mess. I do remember it being really quiet. All you could hear was the sound of our sneakers crunching on the leaves and twigs underfoot. It was unnaturally quiet, kind of unnerving to say the least. All of a sudden, Jason stopped very abruptly and I dang near bumped straight into him. I even asked him what's the big idea. He ordered me to be quiet peering around. I wondered what he'd seen. His eyes seemed fixated on something. Something that was just beyond my vision. Something that I could not see. What was it? Possibly a bear? I know they're around here. Dad always told us about them. And even at that young age, I knew running into one would be bad news. Now most of the time, bears will usually run away, but if you encounter a mama bear with her cubs nearby, you'd better run for the hills or try and climb a tree. But then again, bears climb trees. So could it have been a coyote or even a wolf that he was looking at? But I didn't think we had bears, coyotes, or wolves out where we were. Then I saw it. I'm not afraid to tell you that I peed my pants as I clung onto my brother for dear life. I was pretty sure that we were as good as dead. What we saw standing amongst the trees on two legs, not even 10 feet away from us was what I can only describe as a wolf man or dog man. It had the head of a Doberman pincher and a very sleek muscular body. It was very toned. And it had very, very short hair or fur, short enough that we could see each individual rippling muscle underneath. It must have been well over seven feet tall, because my dad at the time was a tall guy, probably 6'1 or 6'2, and this thing stood taller than him. It was also much wider than him. It was like a really muscular man. My brain instantly thought of the way men looked in those bodybuilding competitions. Really wide at the shoulders like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but again the head was unmistakably that of a Doberman Pinscher, but larger almost too large, like it wasn't proportioned with its body, and all I remember seeing were white teeth amongst the darkness and yellow glowing eyes. It bared its teeth at us and howled, but it wasn't like a howl in a traditional sense like a wolf does. This was an ungodly, unholy howl, 
like a distorted human yell mixed with that of a painful cry of a dog. It was awful. Run. Jason had yelled at me and we hot-toted out of there quicker than we ever moved before. We learned as we got older, you're not supposed to ever run from a predator. But at this age and being caught up in total fear, we had no other option. This thing surprisingly didn't give chase to us and somehow luck was on our side. We came tearing out of the woods and straightened my dad's arms. He had heard the cry too and was coming and looking for us. He thought we had really been hurt by the sounds of it. When we told him what we had seen, he made us get into the tent to sit down and collect ourselves. He didn't seem too concerned, so as I look back on it, I wonder if he believed us. After we told him all the details, he asked if we could show him where it happened. So, a little later, we went back into the woods with a flashlight and a shotgun. Obviously, I felt much safer with my father, even though I did stay tucked behind him and held onto his shirt while peeking forward the entire time. Of course, we didn't see anything not with him, and he never saw anything out of the ordinary either. At least not that he told us. But you can imagine, because of that event, we didn't get an ounce of sleep that night, and we left the first thing the following morning. My brother and I kept talking to him about it, even the following morning, which is why we left. I can recall my father getting kind of annoyed with us because he thought we had just had a mistaken identity of a bear or possibly a wolf and totally blew it out of proportion. He seemed frustrated with having to listen to us. And it doesn't help that kids have a natural tendency to exaggerate what they've seen. So that's why I believe that he did not believe our story. But I think others here might have sympathy for us. I understand that it's going to be especially hard to believe my story. I don't have the credentials to prove that I'm a reliable source, and I don't have any proof of what I've seen. I'm not a secret agent or a member of the military. I'm a contractor. I receive a plan for the development of a structure, and I execute that plan. I've been doing it long enough that I'm now a member of a small group who receives exclusive contracts from the United States government. Recently, some of the work commissioned from us by the government has been released to the public. If it wasn't for the accessibility of these documents, I wouldn't be talking. Before this, it was classified. But now, anybody can know this story. The exposure of my identity isn't at the same level of risk it once was. We were hired nearly a decade ago to build a rotunda on a United States military base in South Korea. The scale of the building was incredible. The pay being offered for our participation and our silence was equally impressive. Needless to say, we all agreed to come aboard this project. We hadn't been tempted to violate any privacy agreements in the past. We didn't care about the things we'd see or the purpose of the buildings we were constructing. In our minds, being silent was just typical military protocol. We figured they were just building structures to store weapons. Structures to protect our country's assets. But we soon found out that this one was different. This rotunda was being designed to conceal something. Something that was already there. An object of some sort. When we arrived on site, we discovered an area roughly 500 feet in diameter, closed off by caution tape, and covered by a layer of heavy tarps. Armed guards dotted the outline of that circle every 50 feet or so. The building we were erecting was being assembled on top of this object. The guards would stay inside even as we put the wall together and built the ceiling overhead. For a while, this was merely another job. Tensions were high with all of the security around us, but we managed to carve a typical routine out of the absurd. Then came the storm. South Korea is no stranger to tropical disasters. One day out of nowhere, one of those tropical storms came in from the sea. It was challenging our resolve and the stability of our work. We hurried to secure the elements of the building we had already assembled. Obviously, we didn't want to lose weeks of work. No one could have prepared us for win that day. Not even the military was ready for it. Sure enough, the unrelenting gusts ripped open a fraction of those tarps. Although none of us would admit it out loud, we saw what was under there. It was a vehicle of some kind, identifiable only by the prong-like legs that jutted out from below the massive metal. 
It was clear that those legs could be lowered and retracted, similar to the wheels of a plane, but it was far too large to be anything man-made. It was too large to even imagine it in motion. How could anyone power something like that? Something so huge. It was a disc nearly as long as a football field. A single haunting apparatus that shocked our minds. There were no seams in the metal, no obvious places where the metal panels would have been welded shut. We saw a glass dome at the top, something like a cockpit maybe. Looking at it turned our stomachs when we realized what was happening. The military hurriedly covered the craft back up, grabbing at the tarps as the wind whipped them around. They were panicked that the craft had been revealed. That was obvious by the way they were acting and the looks on their faces. They ushered us off the base and salted us with questions. We all played a convincing degree of stupid, saying we hadn't seen anything. Eventually the storm passed and we all returned to finish our work. We were quietly, only periodically giving each other quick glances with knowing looks in our eyes. However, there were no more glimpses of the craft, but we did notice additional members of security on site. After the incident, fleets of men in black suits had joined the perimeter. These men stared at us as we worked, and there was always one off in the distance atop a tower with his eyes on us too. I imagine they were listening as well, making sure we didn't talk to each other. All of us silently agreed to finish that job pretending nothing out of the ordinary had happened. I think we all suspected that an outburst would lead to severe repercussions. To be honest, I wasn't sure if we'd be allowed out of South Korea with our lives intact. But eventually the job ended and we were sent home. All of us were welcomed by the ambient static of wiretaps in our phones and by idling vehicles on our streets. Our job ended, but theirs had just begun. They had to watch us to make sure, I guess. They had to be positive that we weren't going to expose them before they were ready to spin the truth to their benefit. And recently, that's what's happening. The information is flying under the radar, but among declassified documents are claims that the military has been performing duties like this in order to keep people safe. But they're leaving something out of those reports. They're excluding the details of that cockpit, of what we saw that made us all feel sick. Under the tarps, inside the craft, something was alive. Something turned its head on the other side of the glass and looked out at us. Its face was warped into some nightmarish scream. Its jaw was extended and its eyes were the size of oranges. It looked like it was screaming, muted by the glass and the tarps and the wind. Whatever it was, it was trapped. And it didn't look like it was trapped in there for our own protection. It looked like a prisoner. And maybe that's the detail that exposes everything. Maybe that's the detail that proves we were really there. Maybe those government agents will appear back on my street someday, and they will walk right up to my door and drag me away. It wouldn't surprise me, I guess. But there's always the other option, isn't there? There's another possibility. There's a chance that the next thing they expose is the final piece of the puzzle. The final piece of truth. There's a chance they'll admit that they don't just have an aircraft in their possession. Maybe it's only a matter of time before they admit that they have life forms here too. Life forms that we don't understand they're trapped here on our planet. That's right. It's only a matter of time. My name is James, and I work as a game warden for the Fish and Wildlife Service in Oregon. I've spent over a decade immersed in the wilderness, but an incident a few weeks ago was absolutely unique in my career. During a standard patrol, I found myself deep in a secluded section of the forest that's usually void of human activity. I often relished its peaceful isolation, but that day, the atmosphere felt different. My role as a game warden entails lengthy periods in the wilderness, monitoring wildlife behavior, checking for poacher activity, and ensuring visitor safety. It's a demanding yet fulfilling job where no two days are the same, and because of this I knew something was off. That's why the day of the incident was so disconcerting. The usual serene quiet of the forest was replaced by an almost tangible tension. The smell of decay was out of place in the fresh woodland air. The usual tranquility was replaced with an ominous dread, 
As I delved deeper into the woods, an unusual smell became apparent. It was the scent of decay, so strong that it left a bitter taste in my mouth. I've encountered the smell of deceased animals before, but this was different, more powerful and unnerving. Alongside this, I spotted broken branches and disturbed soil, suggesting something large had passed through. With each step, the dread increased. I felt a warning in my gut, telling me something was awry. It was an odd sensation, a mixture of anticipation and fear unlike anything I'd experienced in my years of patrolling these woods. Then, in a clearing, I saw it, a towering creature, roughly nine feet tall. My mind grappled with the sight, trying to reconcile what I was seeing with my understanding of the natural world. The creature towered above me, looming in a manner that was both awe-inspiring and intimidating. It was an uncanny combination of familiar elements and grotesque distortions that challenged my reality. The creature's skeletal body, framed by the stark outline of a deer skull, was just like what you'd expect in a horror story. My heart throbbed heavily in my chest, and its beats echoed loudly in my ears. It was a rhythm that was a grim reminder of the perilous situation I was in. I felt a sharp, icy jolt of adrenaline surge through my veins, awakening every cell in my body. A survival instinct triggered by the undeniable presence of danger. Despite the years of training I had under my belt, nothing had prepared me for an encounter like this. My body seemed to move independently of my will, rendering me immobile. I was anchored to the spot, like a sailor caught in the gaze of a siren, incapable of doing anything other than observe the chilling sight before me. The creature's skull held an unusual feature. It held two red glowing lights. They burned in the empty eye sockets. These luminescent orbs created an eerie and unnatural spectacle as they cut through the dim forest light. They seemed to pulse with an uncanny life of their own. This was a sight as captivating as it was terrifying. It held me in its thrall. The light seemed to hum with an otherworldly energy. The next few moments stretched out, each second feeling like a tiny eternity as I remained rooted in place. Time seemed to lose its meaning, warping and twisting around me as I stood transfixed by the creature. Fear held me and kept my gaze locked on the creature. It was a silent fear, the kind that resonates deep in your bones and paralyzes your thoughts, reducing the world to just you and the object in front of you. Overwhelmed by the sight of this monstrous creature and the smell of decay, I couldn't think. I was left standing there, my mind racing to understand what I had seen. Part of me, the biologist part, was fascinated and wanted to observe and understand. But another part of me, the instinctive part that values survival, was shouting for me to get away. I was torn between professional curiosity and the basic instinct to escape with my life. I considered capturing the creature on camera, but my hands wouldn't cooperate. Deciding it was best to remain still, and I watched as the creature eventually moved away. Seeing my chance, I quietly retreated, keeping my gaze on the spot where the creature had vanished until I was safely away. What followed was a blur. I reported the incident to my superiors, who dismissed it as a misidentified animal protecting its kill. The smell of decay lingered for days, and those glowing eyes haunted my nightmares. In the days that followed, I wrestled with the experience. The memory of the creature was burned into my mind, reappearing in my dreams and turning them into nightmares. The smell of decay, now linked with the creature, seemed to follow me. I could literally smell it everywhere. At work, my colleagues were skeptical dismissing my story. Some even suggested it might have been a prank. Their doubt was disheartening. Despite this, I continued my work. But now with a heightened sense of awareness. I couldn't ignore what I had seen. The encounter made me question a lot, but also changed me. I've come to accept that there are things that cannot be explained with science, and that's all right. It's part of what makes the wilderness so intriguing. Let me know your thoughts, Donovan. Thanks for your time.
This story brings us a strange and unexplainable disappearance from Pennsylvania in the 1800s. The Allegheny National Forest is incredibly vast. It spans a large part of the north central portion of the state of Pennsylvania. It is just as wild and mysterious as the Appalachian Forest, but lesser known. The area also witnesses many people going missing every year. One of the strangest cases is that of Edward Jewett. The case is still unsolved from over 160 years ago. Edward disappeared from his home in Whitehead Hill in Warren County. He was a man in his 70s, described as frail and small. He was a very friendly and sweet old man, adorned with a gray beard and a brush of shaggy gray hair that stuck out beneath his small cap. Like all men of the time, he wore leather boots with his trousers tucked in to keep his trousers clean. He was the type of person that practically had no enemies because he was so well received by his peers. He lived with his wife in a small log cabin just a short distance from his son, Enoch. He spent a lot of time visiting with nearby neighbors and socializing, so he was pretty well known in his community. Edward also had a dog named Jerry that was practically his shadow. It was common for Edward to go on daily walks with Jerry following him everywhere. The day of his disappearance was not any different. It was a day in early spring and it was later in the afternoon. Edward had stepped outside, with his wife later claiming he never put on his coat, nor did Jerry follow him outside. It's not likely that Edward had just wandered off by himself since at the time he needed assistance walking with a cane. His family and friends couldn't believe that he would have made it more than a mile. After some time had passed, an unknown amount of time, a search had finally begun for Edward in the mountain range surrounding his tiny cabin, it was a rather large group consisting of 90 men divided into groups of 10. The forest around his log cabin home was searched, checking every nook and cranny, hollow tree, and crevice. Fortunately, there were no open wells, creeks, or mines that would give Edward the possibility of falling into and hurting himself. One thing that's very strange is that at this time, there was still snow on the ground, but virtually no trace of Edward's tracks could be found anywhere. Indeed, if he had wandered off in the woods, they would surely find his tracks. There is suspicion that there was a conflict between Enoch and his father, but it's all hearsay. Is it possible he was grabbed, murdered, and disposed of? Or like many of the others who just vanished without a trace? Did he somehow wander off where nobody would find him? Of course, there are many theories floating around that he was abducted by aliens or taken by monsters of the forest. But unfortunately, it was so long ago that we'll never know. It seems as though he had just stepped off the face of the earth, disappearing into eternity. There are no answers as to whatever truly happened to Edward Jewett in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm.